Great. All right. Well, it's it's a couple minutes after, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AAPI Communities and Conversations series, a series of live online conversations between writers, creators, and librarians that centers Asian American and Pacific Islander voices, books, cultures, and experiences. This monthly program is hosted by the University of South Carolina's Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, Publishers Weekly, and Penguin Random House Library Marketing. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. My name is Karen Wong, and I am a children's librarian at the New York Public Library. And joining me today is the esteemed author and illustrator, James Yang. James's book, Stop A Bus Stop, was selected as an outstanding picture book by the New York Times, and the follow-up, Stop Bot, received the 2020 Geisel Award for the most distinguished American book for beginning readers. So today we'll be discussing James's most recent book, A Boy Named Isamu, which pays homage to the Japanese American artist Isamu Noguchi. The book received a star review in Kirkus and was selected by the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association as the 2022 Honor Picture Book for Asian Pacific American Literature. So James, thank you so much for joining us today. Our library and publishing colleagues are very excited to hear from you. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very, very excited to be here too. Great. So to get started, first, maybe you can share a bit about the book, A Boy Named Asamu, um, and about Asamu Noguchi himself. Uh, as I mentioned, he was a Japanese American artist. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about his work and his legacy for folks in the audience who may not be as familiar with Noguchi. All right. Uh... Well, uh, to start off, Isamu Noguchi is, half, is a famous American sculptor and Japanese American sculptor and designer. He was born in 1904 and he's half Japanese, half American. His father was, I believe, a poet or sculptor, but his father's Japanese and his, and his mom was American. And he, you may know a lot of his work without even knowing it. Like he's probably most famous for the Noguchi table which is uh, part of the Herman Miller collection. And a lot of these designs were created by Herman Miller uh, as mid-century furniture. He was also known for uh, work in the 50s and 60s, especially his sculptures and creating rock gardens, uh, um, which were sort of metaphors for uh, the home he never had. Because as a young child, uh, when he was a kid playing in the U.S., he never felt like he quite fit in because the other kids saw him as too Japanese. And the amazing part of the story is his, his mom's actually quite amazing. Like she did take him to Japan even after her and her husband had split up when Osama was a very young boy. But she decided to go to Japan so that he could have a chance to experience his culture there. And then the reverse happened, where um, the kids would not play with him because he's too American. So he. We don't know much about Isamu's childhood, but we do know that his childhood was lonely and that he did spend time in nature um, to, to just sort that, that's where he found comfort. And later that's what informed a lot of him as an artist as well. And a lot of his work really is the reduction of elements he found in nature that sort of spoke to him to their main essentials. So for me, the there's a lot in his story that connected. Um, I grew up in as the we were the only Korean family in Oklahoma, in my small town in Oklahoma. So there's that. So there's the same experience. And I'll be honest, I was probably more popular than Asana was in school. But <laughs> you know, but uh, there's those moments when you still feel like you don't fit in with everyone else. And I don't think this is specifically just an Asian American experience. I feel like. A lot of students, if you weren't the quarterback or the lead cheerleader, you probably understand that feeling too. So it's sort of a universal feeling. And like a uh, young Asamu, I also um, did ride my bike to my favorite place to sort of just think things through and dream bigger dreams. So one of the books that, I know that you're kind of getting to this, but one of the books that always affected me when I was a little kid was A Snowy mm -hmm. Day, you know, the all time mm -hmm. classic. Yeah, because it's really not about. It's a little bit about, um, yeah, you know, you know, the main character. He's too young to play with the older kids, so he has to play with himself, and it's about exploration. So I've always that book has always moved me, and 
somewhere deep inside, I've always wanted to do my version of it. I just never found the right way to tell it. Or mm -hmm. honestly, I probably wasn't mature enough as a writer or artist to tell it in a way to connect with other people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I looked into the Sami story, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the, this is where I can kind of do that. This resonates a little bit with that kind of story. It resonates with me. And I felt like it was an experience that could resonate with a lot of people. Yeah, that's great. Well, I have a lot of follow-up questions for you, but before we get to that, um, I think for you know everyone on the call, we have a little bit of a treat because James has agreed to read an excerpt from A Boy Named Isamu for us today. So James, I'll turn the floor over to you to do that, and then we can get back to our Q&A. Sounds good. And I'll just read an excerpt. Here, here's the wallpaper from Isamu, which is similar to his earlier sketches. And here's the title page. If you are a boy named Isamu at the market with your mother, it can be a crowded and noisy place. Maybe there is a quiet space that feels more like you. Children are playing loudly. You keep walking. When it is quiet, you wonder what kind of wood, why does the clock feel soft? What kind of wood is this? How does the fruit get its color? Who made the path to stone? Paper lanterns are like another world far away from home. How can the light feel so welcoming? In the forest, the trees tower over you as you hear the crunch of twigs under your feet. The leaves are so perfect, they must have been waiting for you. You toss grass in the air and watch those blades scatter in different directions. When you close your eyes, you imagine the grass comes back to you. If you are a Samu, stones are the most special of all. Time has carved each stone to be different. How can they be so heavy? Would they float if they had no weight? They can be smooth or rough. You press your ears against the stone. What is it saying? Thank you. That's so beautiful. Oh, thanks. So lovely to hear you reading your own stories. Lovely. Um, so you, you mentioned a bit about what drew you to uh, the story and the life and the work of Noguchi. Um, can you talk about how you first learned about Noguchi um, and uh, what made you choose to depict a day of his childhood um, in terms of creating a book about him rather than like the approach of a biography of his whole life, for example? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, I must have learned about Isamu Noguchi when I was even in grade school. So I grew up in, I grew up as a grade school child in the 1960s. So he, uh, he immediately became a hero of mine because there weren't many examples uh, of Asian or Asian American artists. So this was a big, this is a big deal, especially if you're uh, the only Korean kid in a small town. You know, I felt like a bit like the Omega Man, like we were the last of a lost tribe. That was kind of the feeling. And then partially his shapes really appealed to me because it is, he did have those classic mid-century shapes. And as a little boy, I used to watch, I love the Jetsons and I'm a big, <laughs> I loved all the space shows. And you have to remember the space program is a big deal then. Like we're all little kids in, you know, in school where the teacher pulls out the monitor and we just all sit around it and then just watch, watch the launches. So all that's coming into play here with Noguchi. And also um, another book which hit me really big is uh, Frederick, Frederick the Mouse by Leo Leone. Mm -hmm. And his shapes are a lot like Noguchi sculptures too. So you'll see a lot of that uh, throughout my work actually. And, and then as far as why, uh, I think the second part of your question was uh, why, why this way? 
and actually there was another institution who had approached me about doing a Noguchi book. And, and they had a good idea, which was like, well, let's do it as a child, to show them experimenting with the elements that would later become the sculptures. And of course, they wanted to do, to do more of a story like a little Noguchi played with wood, which may be translated into these sculptures. And I feel like that's a totally valid way to do a book. Was, but there was just something in this weird situation where I felt like his story could be told more poetically and mm -hmm. in a weird way. Uh, maybe I could catch a more accurate picture of Noguchi in sort of a make-believe story. Uh, so that was part of the, that was a lot of the motivation. And it's, um, I would hardly, maybe my art directors and editors will disagree, but I'm, I'm hardly a diva person. <laughs> but this was one of the rare, rare situations where something inside of me just felt like, this is a story I know how to tell. Mm -hmm. And I know the right tone for the story. He's, you know, if you look at his work, his work is poetry. It's very minimal poetry. Even Noguchi himself says he takes away the unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And um, something about that just spoke to me emotionally too, because even my work as an illustrator, I'm known for being reasonably spare also. So there's a lot of intersection with my interests and Isami's interests as well. So I was really, that was a lot of the inspiration for this. No, oh, I think that makes sense. You felt a real personal connection to his story. And that is what influenced your vision for how you wanted to, to tell his story. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you did mention that Noguchi's art has influenced um, some of, uh, or, there, or there are some similarities and influences between his art and yours. Um, can you describe any specific choices that you made with this particular book that were influenced by his art, like in the use of space or textures or proportion, anything like that? I would say all of, yes to all of that. <laughs> uh, well, okay, one of the, if you've noticed, I'm just going to wildly assume you've seen my other books. <laughs> so, uh, but if you notice, they're, they're all very full color books, very rich palettes, fills up the whole page. And we decide, I decided that we needed to go an opposite way because I've always wanted to do flight space because of Leo Leone. And then um, uh, just a, and then flight space also speaks to the Gucci's idea about what's necessary. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like that was very important. And then also, um, even the way I compositionally do things may sort of echo the way Noguchi arranged his sculptures or elements in space. So that has something to do with it too. And then uh, and absolutely the rocks, I knew that there had to be a very important element. I mean, literally the most comprehensive biography on Isama Noguchi, and this is a giant thick book like this, you know, you can learn a lot about Noguchi and also work on your biceps. It's, it's a giant book, but it's titled Listening to Stone. So I, I knew it right away. It's like, that has to be an important element in the language of the book. Um, I could share some of the spreads if you would like me to do that, that, that were sort of like a, a Noguchi's thing and how it kind of influenced some of the pages in my book, if you like. That would be great. Let me go ahead and grab that here. Okay, we'll do the play button. Great. There we go, now we see it. Great. But, okay, so with flight space, when I was a kid, one of my <clears throat> favorite ad campaigns, and this came, out, <clears throat> this came out in the 60s, was this, and this is a revolutionary ad in the history of advertising, uh, Volkswagen's Think Small. And even as a child, that page has always been a big deal. So that's, that's a, in a weird way, this uh, sense of flight space, was a real big influence. And I'm not a guy who's gonna just force <clears throat> a visual look on a story just to force it. It was just a situation where this was the perfect way to handle it, handle this. And, and you know, here's an example of some drawings that Noguchi did, cut paper drawings for sculptures. So you definitely get where I got the inspiration for the end papers. An idea how he arranges space. So you can sort of see the, see the similarities of how optics are placed. 
even the point of view, you, normally I do sort of a very flat two-dimensional point of view. And, and I do that for visual reasons. I like the simplicity of compositions. Mark Rothko is one of my favorite, and Paul Clay are two of my favorite artists, which had that very head on. But I added a little bit of dimension in this case on the Cotton Gucci space. You can see that again. So you definitely see a lot of the parallels. And also, um, I'm lucky my wife is a choreographer and she's a Hong Konger. So a lot of her performances and projects are in Asia. So another reason I drew this was I remember walking through paper lanterns in a night market in Kyoto. And it is like a beautiful sort. You feel like you're in an indie movie, like a movie made by A24 Studios or something. And it's just otherworldly when you walk through paper lanterns. It's just, it's just such a beautiful sensation. So. I knew that I had to put that in there somewhere in this book. And I had just found this illustration of the garden at night, which pretty much echoes this. But the crazy thing is, is that I saw that image after I did, did this final image. So. Um, That's incredible. Well, you know what's nice is, uh, and one of the nicer things is that when the Noguchi Museum liked it, that meant a lot, this book, that meant a lot to me and they carried it. And my goal was, is I wanted to do a fictitious story, but it had to echo Noguchi enough so that, you know, I mean, mentally, I didn't, it wasn't a major game plan in my book. Like, you know, I, I was like, if the Noguchi Museum thought it was a good book, that means that I didn't stray too far from the truth. So that meant the world to me when they actually called me a couple of weeks after A Boy Named Osamo came out, asked to read it, and then like an hour later, they asked if they could carry it, so. You can imagine that was pretty much a dream come true. Oh, that's great. It's like you're you're channeling Noguchi's spirit in a way that you were able to create these these illustrations that echo his work, in some cases, things that you hadn't even seen yet. <laughs> well, 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 that was the that was sort of the hope in a way, because I do this philosophy when I draw things um, for most of my projects or assignments where, I like to look at things and research them, and then I sort of put them away and kind of and kind of forget them. And uh, part of it is because when you misremember things, it sort of adds an extra special quality to the work. So that's kind. Of, I actually learned that trick from. I had heard a talk with Quentin Tarantino of all things, and he said when he was poor, uh, he couldn't afford to rent videos, so he'd go to the movies to remember movies and write the scripts down for class, but he misremembered them. And what he misremembered was actually better than the actual written script. And that's when he decided, you know what, maybe I'm not an actor, maybe I'm a writer. So I thought that was like an excellent sort of visual, tri visual trick I do with myself a lot too. That's great. And that kind of leads me into um, my next question, which is as you were working on the book, did you learn anything new about Noguchi that was particularly surprising or poignant or interesting to you that then made its way into the final book? Ironically, the tone, the tone. I mean, I suspected that he was sad as a child, but I didn't really uh, know that for sure. So once I did a little bit more research, that was a big deal. And I was like, oh, so maybe I can be a little bit vulnerable. I'm a happy guy, but you know, that's, that's something that, Asana, I can relate to it as Simon's childhood. And this is mm -hmm. probably my most emotionally vulnerable book. And it's not like, I, I don't think, you know, I'm not being all suicidal at the end, you know, and life is hopeless. I'm not doing any of that, but just that little bit of feeling that you feel sometimes um, that was informed. Um, also the fact that why he created his landscapes and they're beautiful. I, if you ever get a chance, this is sort of like my wife and I, we, we happened to go to Takamatsu in Japan and just a stroke of luck, I didn't realize Noguchi's workshop is there, mm. Japanese workshop. So we went, he landscaped everything. So you got to see his world. And it's one of the few times I just sort of saw the world through his eyes. And actually he has that giant round sculpture called The Void. And it's the first time I ever got teary eyed you know, because you, you just sort of saw everything that he wanted to see. And you realize like, yeah, he, he was trying to create the home he never had. That's what he's doing here. Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and that, that hit me big time. 
you know, it's like, it's like uh, I don't feel really at home here. I don't feel at home there. Maybe I can create my home, you know? And I felt like that was a pretty wow. hard hitting, beautiful lesson to learn. Wow. Well, sort of, again, leading to my next question, what do you hope young readers will take away from this book? And is there any particularly memorable response that you've gotten to the book so far, either from a young reader or anyone else or from the Noguchi Museum? Um, any kind of responses that have been noteworthy for you? Oh, wow. Um, well, well, you know, there's a couple of things I want. I want kids who aren't, you know, who do feel a little bit outside the norm and not just Asian Americans. Uh, I mean, of course, there's a lot of Asian Americans who, who are friends of mine who are wonderful artists. We all have similar stories. But anyone who doesn't feel like they quite fit in, or it may not even be that you are an oddball at all. Maybe you just prefer, you're the kid who prefers to like play by yourself. I wanted everyone, all those kids to know they were okay. And what was wonderful that I was surprised that like one parent of an autistic child sent me a nice note and said that I could really spoke to him and his child so much. So that was very touching. Yeah. And I have heard from Hoppe children that this book really connected. So that's the kind of thing you hope, I'm not Hoppe, you know, but I was hoping that was something that could be related by many different people. So mm -hmm. those were all very touching to say the least. And by Hoppe, just for those who may not know in the audience, you mean like multiracial children yeah. from multiracial families? And, and, and it's usually uh, Japan is like the first generation, right? You, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, in the U.S. and they're, they're mixed. So uh, th that, I think that helped a lot. Like a lot of people outside of, outside of just Asian American connected with the book. And that was a goal because I feel like even if I'm, this is a little lofty, but even when I'm telling stories, I wanted to tell like the thing that now I want to hit things that kind of hit me, but are the part that everybody else hits too also, not just. I don't want to be indulgent. So it was nice to know that maybe I, that I, maybe I stayed <laughs> past that indulgent line, which was a relief. <laughs> you, you know, and to hear the Noguchi Museum just, uh, you know, they, they, they thought it was like a beautiful homage to Noguchi. So that was almost like I passed my teacher's <laughs> grade for my report. So that, 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 was, that was very satisfying. That's great. And I, you know, and I think, yeah, I, I definitely don't see any self-indulgence in, in this book. And I, I think, as you said, it's, it's, a, it's, a universal, it's a universal experience that, that children have, you know, a sense of, of feeling different or isolated in some way or the other. It may not necessarily be because of race, but um, I think it's a, a, a real universal shared experience that you tapped into through a very specific story. And I also feel like kids... Uh kids probably do spend a lot of time alone, you know, regardless. And it's, and it's okay. I think that's another message. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel like, um, you know, what's fascinating is that I was talking to a couple other friends of mine who are, who've done some beautiful books, by the way. You, you know, for example, Victor Nye, who did uh, Wishing. I, I believe that's the one that she illustrated. That's just a, a beautiful book too. But we talked about our childhoods. And then what she said was she remembers just being bored all the time, you know? And I was like, yeah, me too. And, <laughs> but there's something in that boredom and I'm, it's pretty common thread. Even my wife, who's a choreographer, she remembers like, like her dad was like the accountant for a factory that created plastic toys and stuff. So she has a, she's out there all day and maybe the past time she would walk among the plastic flowers and imagine it was an imaginary forest. You know, and probably it's not a coincidence why she became a choreographer. Mm -hmm. So, I'll, yeah. you know, I also wanted to talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, do you think that, um, you know, we've talked about this a little bit uh, in terms of this book, but in terms of your larger work overall, do you think that your personal identity or your cultural heritage influences your work or your approach uh, to art and books? I would say subtly, you know, subtly, of course, in A Boy Named Asami more so. And uh, I, you know, my publisher is interested in me possibly doing a graphic novel loosely based on my life. So that will definitely be influenced. <laughs> <laughs> Or else it's not a or else it's not a great book, right? So, uh, but but I would say some 
I would say aesthetically for sure. Absolutely. And even my approaches to how stories, how visually it looks. And part of it is, um, especially my figures, because my grandfather was a well-known painter in Korea. And he's sort of a transitional painter from abstract. I, I mean, from realism to, to more to abstract, but he's sort of a transitional guy. And, and he drew, his favorite thing was like to draw like, a lot of his work is during, during two wars, Korean War and World War II, but he would draw children playing in fields. So even the simplicity of his compositions are definitely something that echoes in my work. And then I would even say that proportionally the way that I tend to uh, distort the figure is very similar to you. So there's a couple of distinct influences. I would say um, the biggest influence creatively is the whole outside looking in experience as an Asian American. And, and you know what, and I bet you that fits with anybody who, who, who like, uh, whose parents come from a different place, especially if you're a first generation or you travel and you're on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge creative advantage because you can see a lot of things that you probably won't notice if you're too close or inside the culture in a way. So that's mm -hmm. where a lot of my stuff also comes. So it's sort of, you hone your observational skills that yeah. way. Yeah. And, and you know what, and, it's, and of course it comes from many different places. I do, I do do a lot of funny, of course, but I'm usually, you doing funnier books. So it's sort of nice that my editor, Tracy Gates, who had been with me for my last four books, she sort of got me to realize I can do more touching books, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, more serious <laughs> books as, as well as like funnier books. So yeah. it's been nice to, sh to explore both kinds of books. Great. Well, actually taking a step back as we talk about some of the past books that you've worked on, can you speak a bit about how you got your start in illustration and writing and the path that led you to your success today? Well, I, my main intent was to start out as a, like an editorial or freelance illustrator. And I'm lucky to have come out in, a lot of my life is pretty lucky, to be honest with you. My high school teacher in, in a small town in Oklahoma, she happened to know a, a Hall of Fame illustrator named Alan Cober from New York. He was, he was a legendary guy, especially from the 60s and 70s, because she had met him to, because she was a legitimate artist that used to show a lot on the East Coast. So then I saw his work and I, I knew I wanted to become an illustrator. And then she, then she knew uh, one, of the, one of the deans of the design department at Virginia Commonwealth University, which had a very strong illustration and design. And this is very important, like the design, my design training was sort of uh, very much from teachers who were from the Bauhaus tradition. So that informed a lot of how I approach design and compositions also. So, so it was a classic case of taking your portfolio around because Washington DC was the closest place to freelance. And I eventually got picked up by the Washington Post as a freelancer. And um, that's how my career sort of started. It was just one place on my work and it kind of grew. And then I had a transitional phase where I started doing broader work and I was very influenced by like a lot of mid-century stuff. So that's, and then the children's books, uh, I, like my agent just started showing my artwork around to different publishers. And then one of my first books was to illustrate somebody else's book for Harper Collins way back in the day. You may not have even been born yet, Karen. It was like so <laughs> old. And, and, and it was, it's called Build It Up, Knock It Down. I, Tom Hunter was the guy. And once I learned how to do that, once you get a step in the door, or even if it's an outside way, it's a little bit easier to, to, you know, to sort of walk through and then I think I told you this story earlier, but then Harper Collins had a story that they were wanting me to try at for that book. And it was by a famous children's book illustrator who I don't want to mention. And it was the unillustratable text, but they wanted me to take a crack at it. Oh, wow. And, you know, so I was like, all right, let me give it a shot. And then uh, after about like, after a month or so, I told him like, yeah, it is an un unillustratable. <laughs> <laughs> no man can do this. So then, um, <laughs> But then I was like, well, let me try writing my own story. And then they took a look and, and then my editor liked it so much, even though her publisher didn't pick it up. Uh, Simone Kaplan was my editor. She, she took it around and that's kind of like how I got my started children's books. Um, and then I had knocked off for a while because I was doing a lot of other things. Like if you're in New York City, you might even see my subway wallpaper on the train sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then um, I, 
I've been very lucky to have really good, a really good career as an illustrator. But then I just happened to meet Jim Hoover, who's now my current art director at Viking. We were doing a panel about children's books for the Society of Illustrators. And uh, we connected, he asked me to show ideas. I asked him if he was serious or if he's being polite. He, he assured <laughs> me he was serious. So then a month later, I showed him ideas because we had a really good connection. And, and that's how Viking and I kind of like have our relationship to this day now. Then it's been a dream situation because that, uh, as you know, Viking also produced A Snowy Day, which is the ah. book that like meant a lot to me so to have them be my home publishers of yeah yeah I full should circle not complain. yeah <laughs> and I, sh I should i should not bellyache that's <laughs> absolutely true great um well i have an, another couple of questions for you and then um we're going to turn it over to audience questions i see that folks have already started putting questions in the chat and i invite um everyone else to do the same put your questions in there um, and we'll get to those in a, in a moment. Um, but James, I also wanted to ask you, um, what are your hopes and aspirations for the inclusion of Asian American voices in children's literature uh, or illustration or other forms of art and expression? Well, well, I mean, honestly, I feel like we're having a moment. There's so many great things in, I feel like we're in the second wave now, which I had been waiting for, which is now we're, first we had to get through the door. And there's, because when I started out as an illustrator, I might've been one of two illustrators who were on the national scene at the time in the early eighties, you know? And then a few years, like just before the pandemic, I was, remember I was at the award show for Society of Illustrators and I would say 75% of the winners were Asian or Asian American. That's a, what a big change. And then yeah. even I was with a publisher in one of the design magazines and, and he goes, James, do you remember when you were starting out, it, it was just you. And I go like, yeah, this is sort of amazing. So, yeah, but then also now we're getting to the part where I think we're starting to see some work that we can call truly great work. That's Asian American, you know, and that's, or, and it's not just your typical stories like here's the family coming from Asia, epic history from the 20th century. Now we're getting to hear many different kinds of stories, but we're, we're just people who happen to be Asian American. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, for example, Mindy Kaling's Never Have I Ever is a great example. Mm, I love that uh, show. <laughs> you, you know, because it's about a teenage girl going through all this stuff and, and, and she is Indian American and that plays into it, but that's not the point. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, this is it's, her home. You totally yes. get what I mean. Yeah, she's a, it, she's a full character. It's not just all around one single defining characteristic of the character. Absolutely. And uh, of course, everything everywhere all at once is very Chinese American family, but that's not really the point. It's mm -hmm. this fantastic story about a family, you know, and since I have been to Hong Kong a lot, you know, Michelle Yeoh, she, she, I seen so many Hong Kong moms like that, like, like hers, you, you know, so it was, chef kiss you know but it's not really about <laughs> it's not really about being a hong konger it's not really about that you know so i feel like that's what i really hoped for and even in children's books i'm hoping this like yeah here's a story by asian american creative you know the protagonist is asian american here's a story but it's not really that doesn't you know it's more universal than that it's just a story that everybody wants to read that's what i hope mm -hmm. and i want them to be funny i want them to be scary i want them to be heartbreaking i, mm -hmm. I want the whole buffet you know that's what i kind of <laughs> want to see to see not me do specifically but i want to read that stuff you know yeah. i want to be blown away by it yeah that's great well, I, I have more questions for you, but I wanna make sure that we get to the audience questions too. Um, and I see a couple coming through the chat. So why don't we switch over to um, the questions that have come in from our audience first. And then if we have time, we can always go back to, sure, <laughs> to more of, of my questions. Absolutely. Um, but I, so I see a question from Sarah asking, can you tell us about your next project? Um, what might you be working on now? All right. Well, you know what? If, if I may be a little shameless, I'll show you my book that's coming out in September. Oh, no, yes. October. 
And it's the follow up to uh, stop pot. <laughs> oh, great. You know, and, and this story is a diagonal story. <laughs> so this is, this is an advanced, it's about a runaway sled. And, and I'll just show you a couple of pages from it. I have to show you. It's basically about the sled and it will keep running into characters that keep piling into the sled. And as you can tell in this, the direction is diagonal. <laughs> yeah. And our, way solve, and our way to solve this problem, because in my first book, Bus Stop is Horizontal. Mm -hmm. Tell the story. Second one, Stop Bot. I have and one here. Oh. We've got there, horizontal, diagonal, uh, yeah. vertical, and now we have a uh, horizontal. Uh, yeah, so we couldn't figure out how to produce a hard diagonal. So I was like, well, why don't we just leave the space blank to create that? So I joke with them that like this book is sort of if we took a Samu and stop by and uh, they had a baby. You know? <laughs> and then like, you know, just to give you a feel of like the kind of the humor of it. So. Uh, this, are those penguins flying in yeah, the yeah, yeah, air? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and there's one that like gets dumped in the sled, so. <laughs> Yeah, so you can tell this is a very touching story also. So <laughs> that's coming out uh, That's coming out this October. And, Great. I, and I, re I really like this book a lot. I'm working on another a follow up to another mid century artist. I'm literally talking about it with my new editor, um, Tamar Brass, tomorrow, which will, it's not going to be the same as A Boy Named Osamu, but it's something that you could pair together. And you'd feel like, 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 oh yeah, this this is the guy that writes those kind of books, you know, about creators. And it's a it's a fictitious story too. It might be a little bit more about objects, but more like how kids interact with it. And, and then also um, the other project I'm thinking about is is the graphic it's a graphic novel story loosely based on my life. And this will be this is sort of fits your earlier question, like you want to see Asian Americans do. Hopefully, if I pull this off correctly, this will be more like my story if it was Caribbean enthusiasm, but it'll be it'll be accurate. Like <laughs> that was the pitch I gave. They like it, and now I have to pull it off. I guess so. That's I have to do the hard part now. So we'll, we'll see that, how that one goes. That sounds really intriguing. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure yeah, it we're all. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. Yeah, thank, but thanks for that question. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, that, that quite, uh, thank you, Sarah, for your question. Um, and our next question is from Meg. Out of all the books and editorial projects that you've worked on, is there one that you enjoyed working on the most? Oh, what a great question. Definitely A Boy Named Asami was up there, obviously. It's, it's a labor of love. It's kind of the story that I wanted to for a long time. And as a creative, um, you know what? This book came out pretty much how I hoped it would. And that's all the way from how the story worked out, how the images looked, and even the something, of course, librarians would notice, but like the printing, even the printing, technical printing quality, uh, I, I thought was pretty uh, impeccable. So that was satisfying. Uh, I also thoroughly enjoyed doing the wallpaper for the uh, for the Metropolitan, I mean, for the Metropolitan Transit Authority. That was, yeah. you, you can imagine that was so exciting. And I got to wear, they showed me a prototype when it first came out, so I got to wear the hard hat. But, <laughs> so I'm very excited that I finally got to do a project with a hard hat. So th those might at the time. Oh, and then also Golf Digest. They had I'm a golf nut because once you're I'm Korean, and apparently there's a DNA when you're 35 that you become obsessed with golf. You're <laughs> Korean now, can't help it. And then they sent me to Augusta to. Um, be the, their artist on site to do a whole full feature. And then they asked me to write. And that ah. story actually won a golf writing award, which ironically gave me, my editor saw that before I wrote a song and she literally told me like, oh, you can't actually write. So <laughs> you have to write better for a song. So <laughs> those, those are the three that really stick out that I really enjoyed, wow. you know, uh, illustrate. Both are fun careers. You get to do things that you sort of dream about. So it's great. Yeah, it's such different projects from one another as well. You've yes. really gotten to work on a variety of different kinds of things. And that's very lucky. Uh, I mean, that's that's sort of the, yeah, you just sort of surf to wherever things go and see what happens. That's great. 
that, that actually leads me back to one of the questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, and while we're discussing that for the audience, if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but James, I wanted to ask what advice you would give to early professionals, um, especially those maybe from underrepresented backgrounds who are interested in a career in illustration, design, or writing. I'll give a super practical one first, which is uh, have to have a website, a proper website. Um, you know, with like twelve, at least twelve or fifteen images of the kind of projects that you want to do. Uh, and then um, that would be my first step. And then also the, the various social media media sites just be regular and post on them like clockwork. And you may not even see much of a response. For example, my Instagram page, uh, it's mainly for my clients or people who, who like, of course, who like me to keep track. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I, de I definitely am not pulling in Kardashian numbers by any means. You know, pull I'm, I'm pulling in Kardashian on a bad day number. And you, you, you know, like, like my whole career is less than her on a bad day. Right? <laughs> but, but I may get 50 likes on an image, but two of them are from art directors who actually use me and hire me so it's really important to make those connections is i understand it's harder to meet art directors in person but uh i would recommend definitely like just doing a little bit of work every day either to find ways to meet new people who, who are in the field or to work on your craft because even to this day i keep working on my craft and looking at things and being observant and it's and it's definitely good to go to all the events that you can we could potentially meet people. Great. Um, and I also just wanted to um, read a message from Meg in the chat um, saying that they've been on train cars with your service design uh, and it always brightens their commute. Oh, yay, mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah, it must be fun to sometimes go onto the subway and you have that experience where you walk on and you say, oh, this is my design here. I always want to, but I'm a little bit too shy to do that. Oh. You know, it's like, you know, but then I, I look around and see if anybody notices and they're all, everyone's doing their thing. Great. And I see Miriam put a, a link in the chat uh, to take us to a little more information about that as well. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Great. Well, we have to wrap up soon. I just have one last question for you that um, I know when we were chatting before this, we talked a little bit about, um, and I thought it would be sort of a good, good ending question. Um, what are your thoughts on libraries and their place in supporting or building diverse and inclusive communities? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think they're immensely important because even a lot of who I am you know, a lot of how I am formed as a children's book illustrator and author today is because of children's libraries, both in grade school, like we had a wonderful library, and also even picture books, because I, I was aware of Caldecott and Newberry Winners. And in the summers, you know, when I was a kid, this is back when parents like just dropped you off someplace and came back hours later, <laughs> wherever, you know, and, and it was awesome. So mom in, in Oklahoma was really hot. We get dropped off at the public library. And I remember like my sister and I, we would go downstairs to the children's library. And there were the rows of all the Caldecott books from the first one to whatever the present for me and Newberry. And my sister and I, those were the priority because then he was like, oh, the librarian said that these must be the important books. So creatively, a lot of how I'm formed is because of libraries and librarians. And and to see more books about yourself would be a huge, is a huge, huge, huge deal. Mm -hmm. you, you know, um, think about when I'm in the 60s and we're not getting much of that. So a book that's like you, that's not in a, that's not, in, that, that's in a good light where you can feel good about yourself means the world. I, I think that's probably one of the reasons as a kid, I love Star Trek. You know, you have a, you have Sulu, you have, um, mm -hmm. Uhura, Uhura who passed away, you, you know, and then even Spock, I related a lot to him because it's like, oh yeah, I don't fit in, uh, yeah. you know, but those were big deals. That's what we had. So to have more examples, mm -hmm. I think that would just mean be so great for like so many different kids. Yeah. Greater representation. It really matters a lot. Yes. 
Great. Well, we have to wrap up uh, our conversation today. Uh, James, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, and thank you to our hosts, Dr. Nicole Cook, the University of South Carolina's Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, um, our host publisher weekly, and our final host, Penguin Random House Library Marketing. And a special, very, uh, a very special thank you to our audience for joining us today. Again, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. Um, we hope that you'll join the next AAPI Communities in Conversation event on September 6th with guest, with guest author Andrea Wang and conversation with my New York Public Library colleague, Crystal Chen. And James, thank you again. Is there anything else that you'd like to say as we uh, wrap up? Uh, well, thank you for everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. And um, can I sign up for the Andrea Wang next week? Next <laughs> month? That sounds pretty. I yeah, I want, to check, I, want, I want to check that one out too. So we'll get you that Zoom link great. for sure. <laughs> that would be awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye bye.